The following podcast is a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network. Find all the shows by visiting bluecollarroots.com. Here's the president and primary owner of True Tech Tools, licensed engineer, and the nicest BS artist you will ever meet, Bill Spohn. Welcome back to the Building HVAC Science Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Spohn. Today's a fun episode. We'll be talking with Paul Raymer. The topic we'll be talking about is all houses are different, but some can be deadly. Now, Paul's a unique but really complex man. He's equal parts scientist, inventor, business owner, practitioner, author, and I'm probably forgetting a few categories here. Got a couple links to his website, his technical website, the consulting service he does at Hayoka Solutions. And he also publishes books in Salty Air Publishing. He's got a great newsletter, by the way, too. Go to Salty Air Publishing or paulhramer.com and you'll find a link to join his email list. The other cool thing is you really have to take a look. If you're in the building science arena, you got to take a look at the residential ventilation handbook. That's a really great read for those in building science. This episode was recorded in September 2021. Let's listen in as Paul and I have a conversation about the differences in houses. Today, our guest is Paul Raymer, a friend of mine I've known for, gee, seems like 20 years. <laughs> what do you think, Paul? I'm not that old. You're not that old. You're not 20? <laughs> Maybe you're 22. Yeah, there you go. Paul, a lot of the guests may not know you, so let us know where you're from, what you do, and a little bit about your background. I applied for a job one time as a trainer, and they asked me to produce a PowerPoint about myself, which was a really interesting employment technique, particularly for a trainer, because the trainer needs to have to produce PowerPoints. It worked out very well. But anyway, I, I grew up in Manhattan, went to boarding schools and off to Syracuse University and got a degree in creative writing, studying under somebody called George P. Eliot, the less famous than the other George Eliot. But then I went after college, went up to Labrador and taught in a one-room school where the town was situated in the lee of a cliff, which was very much like the native folks that had lived there before. And my one-room school had single glazed windows facing south and held in place with silly putty. So it was pretty cold in there when it was 60 degrees below zero outside. Wow. I decided that a wood stove just wasn't going to hack it in there. And so I decided I should put in a an oil burner. I had no idea how to size an oil burner, but I had this one volume encyclopedia that I'd brought with me and I looked up what a BTU was wow. <laughs> and calculated. I thought I was calculating how many BTUs I needed for this school. And typically I oversized it. I got one for a, a six room house. <laughs> But it was interesting because the school board was not enthusiastic about me doing this. So I had to get friends from back in the States to finance my oil burner. But it taught me a lot about solar gain and... <laughs> and BTUs. And BTUs <laughs> and what you can do with BTUs. I never knew you were born in Manhattan. I did know you went to SU because I'm from Rome, New York. So Syracuse University, there's a connection there. I knew you were into creative writing. And I only found out recently that you worked in Labrador in that one-room schoolhouse. I think you did a Facebook post on it or newsletter. Was it your newsletter? Yes, my newsletter. Yep. So tell us about your newsletter. What do you talk about in a newsletter? It's an interesting thing when you're a sort of unknown writer, you have to build up that fan base. So I publish a newsletter every two weeks, and I try to include a little bit about it myself in there along with, like I often review a book in there and also do a column on building science stuff. And then I am trying to highlight local independent bookstores because I think they're really important things. And I provide links to interesting related websites and 
apps and that kind of thing for people to tune into. How does one subscribe to the newsletter? You can go to my website, which is paulhramer.com, or I can, I don't know, Bill, if you can put a web link. Yeah, I'll put the link in the in the show notes. So Paul H. Reamer. I have a little sign up link that you can just click on and it goes to the okay. sign up. All right. I'll pick that up too. You also had another website with an interesting name to it and a history behind the name. I work now primarily for ICF as a consultant for the EPA on Indoor Air Plus, their Indoor Air Plus program. But prior to that, my wife and I started a company called Hayoka Solutions, and she's still running that. The website is heysol.com. H-E-Y-S-O-L? That's it. But I use it to some extent to still do training and that fun stuff. Where does the Hayoka come from? Hayoka is a contrarian, a person that looks at everything in the opposite direction. <laughs> So there's a Hayoka in Dustin Hoffman's Little Big Man, and the Hayoka is riding his horse backwards. But he's sort of a shaman. So when I started that out, I was doing it to develop products for people. And when they, because I'm not an engineer, Bill, I can look at anything any way I want to, because I don't have any rules. No constraints, no rules. No constraints. What do you mean I can't do that? <laughs> Instead of saying, you say, why not? Yeah. <laughs> That's where Hayoka came from. It was basically people couldn't figure out how to do something, and so they contacted me to help them develop the products. Anything notable in the Hayoka history? Product-wise, there is a bathroom fan controller that started the whole efforts to continuously operate a bathroom fan, and we had a whole house comfort ventilator with motorized insulated doors. You also have written at least one technical book that I know of. Can you talk about that? That's true. The Residential Ventilation Handbook. And that was originally published by McGraw-Hill. You may be surprised at this, but they didn't see a huge market for it. <laughs> <laughs> And so when it got sort of out of date, I self-published the version two, and I'm actually working on version three at the moment because it has a lot of code citations in it, and the codes have changed quite a bit. So people write a book for a reason. They usually see like a gap in the market or a gap in the understanding of things. What gaps are you trying to fill with Residential Ventilation Handbook? Particularly right now, the interesting thing is that because people are building these houses so tightly and ventilation is no longer just a sort of casual. It can't be an afterthought. Maybe we'll put a fart fan in the bathroom or something. And so it has become much more important to the health and safety of the occupants. And when they got even tighter, like Indoor Air Plus from the EPA is considering mandating balanced ventilation as a requirement for that program. And it concerns me a great deal that balanced ventilation sales folks don't do a good job at all of training. Why don't we seize that opportunity right now and explain the difference between balanced and unbalanced ventilation? That is a really interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> and as I'm delivering a session at EBA about uh, what I'm calling the manual BV, because it seems to me that ventilation should be as carefully designed as other HVAC systems. So like manual J figures out all the loads on the house to deliver heating and air conditioning to rooms properly. Well, ventilation should do the same thing. So the difference between a balance, a typical exhaust ventilation system sucks the house, as you know, uh, negative. So it puts the house under negative pressure. So air is moving randomly through cracks and holes throughout the house. Positive pressure ventilation does the opposite. It pressurizes the house and then it leaks back out through the cracks and holes. And balanced is designed to basically provide a neutral pressure on both sides of the pressure boundary. 
so do the work of providing fresh air without impressing pressures on the structure. That's the goal. And if they're not balanced by the installer, then that becomes irrelevant. And the more I've looked at this bill, the more I have decided that balanced ventilation is more or less a nice name, but it's the distribution that really counts. And so the Canadians have a F-326 standard that basically specifies what air should be delivered or extracted from each room in the house. So if you supply, for example, 20 CFM to a master bedroom and 10 CFM to other bedrooms, you can basically add up those requirements and get your ventilation rate. And if you use an HRV or an ERV, a heat recovery or an energy recovery ventilator, your energy penalty becomes really small and you get distributed air throughout the whole house and you basically can ignore ASHRAE 62.2. And I've been on that committee for 15 years, so. <laughs> the ASHRAE 62.2 committee, yeah. ASHRAE 62.2 which is really pretty neat. And then the Canadians also have this really neat little app whose name escapes me at the moment, but it's a air quality that you can actually specify the materials used in a room and consider the impact of the ventilation on those materials as they outgas. And so just like in Manual J, you could actually, if you wanted to get there, specifically say, okay, we need 23 CFM to this particular bedroom because it's using wall-to-wall carpeting and formaldehyde-filled cabinets and that kind of thing. It's sort of like uh, ventilation load. Yeah, exactly. Based on maybe pollutant or effluent, something like that. And so that gets down to where you are <laughs> in measuring these things. I mean, if you're talking about 10 or 12 CFM, it's very hard to find tools, as you well know, to actually measure that stuff. And then the other question becomes, <laughs> you want to wander down this tangled path. If people are going to connect these things to their air handlers, how do I know how much air is being fresh air or new air is being delivered to the master bedrooms by the air handler? because it may be some sort of weird percentage of how much actual conditioned air is being delivered. But how do I measure that? William Shercliffe wrote a very interesting book in 1981 about heat exchangers. And he has some interesting formulas and calculations on uh, new air and some terminology, which is really very awkward and ugly. And so, <laughs> but it, the point is basically bringing the new air in, distributing it, and then pushing the bad air, the old air out. So if the listeners haven't caught on yet, Paul knows an awful lot about residential ventilation. <laughs> and you've expressed it in this book. Where can people get the book if they're interested? Well, the book is available on my website or it's available on Amazon. Got it. So Residential Ventilation Handbook. Version 2. V2. Look for V2. Because V1 actually has black and white pictures and V2 has color pictures. That's the big difference. <laughs> do you get any feedback on the book from users, purchasers, buyers? I do, yeah. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote it the way I did is because, as I told you before, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> and so it's not an engineering text. It's a usable text that has things like, my bathroom fan's too noisy. Why is that? How do I replace it? It does go into pretty deeply into things like sound, which, again, we just debated on Indoor Air Plus, but what is a sound? How does it work? How do you measure it? I'm just going to give you a question I have here. We have a conditioning ERV, so it actually has a heat pump in it to change the thermal element, thermal content of the air coming in, the air going out. And of course, in this season now, it's dehumidifying. So it's got a drain connected to it. I'm getting this very slight echo of this gulping noise as the water trap, as the trap in it moves. Hmm. 
that's echoing through the ductwork. Interesting. Any thoughts on that? One of the interesting things on that is that you have a great house. It's tight. It's efficient. And as houses get tighter, every sound becomes much more noticeable. Then when you get into a zone, one zone is equivalent to a quiet refrigerator in a quiet kitchen. And the noose measurements have gone off on a sideline here, avoiding your question for a second. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not sure there's an answer. <laughs> but the new bathroom fans are so quiet that they're down to 0.3 zones. You can't really measure below 0.3. And that's interesting from your measurement skills. How do you measure sound that's that quiet? And so the sound lab at Texas A&M University, where they're doing these measurements for the Home Ventilating Institute, you walk into that chamber and close this bank vault door behind you, and you can hear your heartbeat. Whoa. It is so quiet in there. And so in order to measure these things, they had a rotating microphone that moved through 180 degrees to take sound level readings at 12 different points. And the motor that rotated that microphone was the loudest thing in the room. So they had to build a fixed array of microphones. So they didn't have to make the motion. And the fan under tests exits into an anechoic chamber on the outlet but they have to bring the air into the chamber as well because one CFM in equals one CFM out. So they had to supply that. They have a calibrated sound creating machine in there so that it balances out all the different sounds and they subtract the different levels and come up with the sound reading. When the EPA suggested that you could just measure the sounds in a bathroom, <laughs> As to how loud a sound fan, you know, you just can't do that. I mean, a decibel meter is not going to work. Well, that's why you're on these committees here is to bring uh, reality to bear to the situation. But for your moisture sound, you said you had, it's an ERV? It's a conditioning ERV, so it's got a heat pump in it. So the energy it recovers has actually a mechanical system, a heat pump, to exchange the thermal energy in the air going out with the air coming in. The Corbett. Lunsford, in his house, he has an ERV, and he was doing his video on on his drainage from his ERV, and I said, Corbett, ERVs don't have drains because they transfer the moisture from the one stream to the other. So he was wondering why he didn't see any moisture out of the drain on his ERV. <laughs> yeah, mine does have a drain. But that's probably because of the conditioning. As you know, you know better than I. Absolutely. But there must be a pressure thing that's making that it do that. Yeah. And it might be just a little bit of pressure relief or maybe a little bit of insulation on kind of that hard plastic pipe. That's what it might be, the vibration being carried along unnecessarily. You'll have to put a sound muffler on your... Yeah. I'll put my ear to the ground <laughs> downstairs. <laughs> you also were involved with a manufacturing company too. You want to talk a little bit about that, some of the products there? I actually started my first company in energy efficiency back in 1977. I had been working for a company that, well, let's see, go back a little bit more. When I was in, living in Manhattan, I was writing one of my novels when I was there. And I thought it'd be cool to take a correspondence course in electronics so I could use it as a plot for a book because I thought correspondence courses were so interesting just the mechanics of it. So I took this correspondence course in consumer electronics, and part of that was building a television set. And so when I moved to Boston, I worked for the Advent Corporation. Oh, loudspeakers? They made loudspeakers, but they also made a projection TV that had these three massive guns that people put them in bars and it had this big wraparound screen and I thought was the ultimate consumer product. <laughs> By guns, you mean CRT? Yeah, projection CRT tubes. Yeah. It won in each color, red, blue, and green. And I got to be one of their final test technicians and was aligning these big, massive 
tubes, putting my hand on 30,000 volts. And <laughs> that's why I am the way I am, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Conditioning your brain. Yeah, it was very, very interesting. But then they were very badly managed. And so I decided that I wanted to get into marine electronics because I love boats. So that's why I started working for this underwater acoustics company down here in Falmouth on Cape Cod. And they were making underwater pingers and other things for positioning oil rigs and that kind of stuff, which was really fascinating about how you can hide a submarine in the thermoclines. And it was just really <laughs> interesting stuff that I had no idea before. And that company was really badly managed as well. And so then the energy embargo hit back in the late 70s. Yeah, 76, 77. Yeah. yeah. And I live in this enormous old inn here on the Cape, and I needed to get warm. And so I got absolutely intrigued by building science. So I was working with these guys. It was really cool. Working with engineers and stuff, they were designing this very sophisticated underwater electronic stuff. And I started a company called it Weather Energy Systems because I figured anything that changes produces energy and what changes more than the weather. So there were a lot of alternatives there. So I brought these guys in and we designed controls for what at that point there was passive houses and active houses. And we designed controls for hybrid active passive houses. And we built these microprocessor-based controls that would scan temperatures all over the house and then make decisions on how to run the fans, what direction to run them, and how fast to run them. Wow. That's sort of like the original smart house. It was. But this is the really cool part. <laughs> This was at the advent of microprocessors when we didn't know if microprocessors could do the things that we wanted them to do. This is really amazing. I'd have this engineer working for me who wrote the code for the micros binary on yellow lined paper. Oh my gosh. One zero one zero one 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 zero one zero zero one one. Every line of code to do this. And you can just imagine what it was like to debug that. <laughs> and on top of that, on top of that, these circuit boards that they had to lay out the lands on the circuit boards with black tape, photograph it, and then reduce it and print it. And when we built double-sided circuit boards, they'd set up capacitive fields between one side of the board and the other. So we'd build these things <laughs> with this one zero code. And when it didn't work, it was truly a detective task to find out what the heck was going on. But we built these things. And I figured we were a small company. We were a tiny company. And one of the things we could do was custom build these. So people were building these amazing custom built passive solar houses. They would name the house and we'd silkscreen the layout of the house on this black plexiglass on the cover of it and put the name of the house on there. And the major electronic circuit board was we make mahogany frames for these circuit boards so that homeowners, they actually, one guy just sat there watching the lights blink around his house and watch things turn on and turn off. It was the most amazing thing. And it, they worked extraordinarily well. But this history about companies not really working. <laughs> yeah. Does it continue? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sensing it does. I didn't want to make people pay for these things. <laughs> and so I undercharged dramatically. It wasn't sustainable. It went from there to simpler systems for syndromes and solariums. I have one of these in my house. It's a fan that goes between the house and my sunroom, and it has a motorized shade inside it, like a window shade, and there's a little motor that pulls the shade down at the end of the day and clamps it into place. So it transfers heat from the sunroom into the house when it's warm in the sunroom and then shuts itself off. It's 
really fun to watch it. My grandson comes over these days and watches the shade. Go, he, he just loves. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that, and then somebody sued me <laughs> in the sunroom greenhouse world, and that was his business strategy was sue everybody that doesn't do what he wants them to do. And so it took me five years to finally win that lawsuit, but it took everything I had. And then that went into another company. That went into Tamarack Technologies, which is still in existence. That's where I think I first met you. Yeah. Probably at a home performance conference. Tamarack makes some interesting products. Like I always thought the cape was interesting. Isn't that interesting? That The concept for that actually came from an HRV manufacturer up in the northern reaches of Vermont called Mem for Magog guy that came up with that. And that was when we were designing a control for modular housing, because we built a modular housing device with, was it eight feeds uh, duct to each room in the house? And so each room had its own thermostat and it blew the air from this air handler in the basement. It was really interesting working with stacked housing. How do you connect the ducts between one box and the next and that kind of thing? Describe the function of the cape. The cape damper is like a sleeve at the end of your sleeve. When it's open, it's open all the way around to the edges of the, and then it's connected at one point. So at one end of it, on the air inlet end of it, it's connected all the way around. You can see my hand moving here, right? Yeah. It's sealed all the way around the edge of the air going in. At the other end, it's only connected at one point. And so when air tries to go backwards through it, the fabric just collapses and blocks the flow. So it's a check valve for air ducts? Yeah. So it's good for things like bath fans. And But the cool thing about it is that it has virtually no resistance to the airflow. Going forward and then leakage, it's pretty good to go in the other way? Pretty t- almost completely tight, yeah. I also look at it and think it looks like a heart valve. Yeah. John Tooley, when he had his colonoscopy, he kept the video of it to use it for training purposes. For training. Okay. (laughs) Not something I would think of. (laughs) It's a strange world. You mentioned a term before an organization, HVI. And I want to make sure people who are not aware know what HVI is and what they do. HVI is the Home Ventilating Institute, and it is a manufacturer's organization. So interestingly, way back in HVI history, there was Brone and there was Newtone making bath fans. And they, just like good old business competitors, they argued. (laughs) They tell each other that one company was over-promoting their fan. It didn't really do what they said it did and that kind of thing. And so they finally got together and said, we really got to put together a a testing protocol and we'll test and see if these things really do work this way. And so the HVI started out with test protocols for, and the interesting thing, which is one of the things about where fans are rated now, they're rated at such a low static pressure. So when you buy a fan that says it's a 100 CFM fan, that's rated at almost no resistance. And the reason for that was that they wanted to come up with a spec that both companies could have all their products fit in. (laughs) So I actually saw a video on LinkedIn, came out just the other day. I don't know if you saw it. I won't mention the manufacturer's name, but I would say they're new to the residential ventilation space. And they had something called uh, static pressure ping pong want to say? Oh my goodness. So they have a a tube that's illuminated backlit with a very lightweight ball in the tube that almost fills the tube. And they have two residential bath fans on either side. They switch them both on simultaneously and see which one wins the static pressure tug of war. (laughs) Very nice illustration. I'll send you that link. That's very cool. And sometimes it takes things like that to help people understand really what's going on. And what's interesting, too, is that it took time for the pressure to build up, the static pressure to build up. That's not always well understood. That's true. 
something else. We correspond an email from time to time, and that's why we're doing this podcast, because I said, hey, <laughs> we're talking all the time. Let's share what we're talking about. One of the things you're doing is research for a new book, a new fiction book. One of the things was about detecting whether people are lying, something to that effect. What was that about? Yeah, I've self-published two novels. The first one is called Recalculating Truth, and it's a young man who is stationed in Guantanamo, realizes that waterboarding people for finding out whether they're lying or not is not the best way to get an accurate representation of the truth. And so he takes advantage of five different human tells that he combines electronically to analyze whether people are lying or not. And it was fascinating doing the research for this because the FBI has all these body language tests and I actually have a piece of software that I can put text into and it will actually flag all the words that are lying words. I can determine whether or not somebody is giving me something that's untrue. And you can also, the way people tell stories, it's absolutely fascinating how people recount a scene and what parts of that scene are important as far as being true and what are our faults. But I can list, put a politician on or someone else on audio and put that through that software and it will tell me all the words that they're making things up. And <laughs> so it's a very interesting tool. So he gets involved with finding out if there are terrorists coming into the country and that kind of thing. And the second book, if I may, sure, which is called Death at the Edge of the Diamond, is more related to this. It is a young man coming of age, coming up to Cape Cod to play in the Cape Cod Baseball League, which is one of the premier stepping stones to Major League Baseball. And he has a summer job working for a contractor. And the woman in the house they're working on is killed. And he has to determine how she died and who did it. And it, the weapon is building science. Wow. So it's a murder mystery with building science at the core. That's right. Wow. And the one I'm working on right now, which should be out next June, also is building science related. So that's a third one that's not published yet. The third one that's unpublished. And that's going to be called Second Law. Second Law. <laughs> For a lot of people, they might think of thermodynamics. That's sort of the rest of the phrase. <laughs> that's right. Where can someone get those novels? Again, they're on at my website or on Amazon or other electronics. I usually like to wrap up conversation with allowing the guests to dispel some myths, things that they hear all the time that they have to repeat, like they'll shake their head a little bit and go, no, no, no. And some things that you have to constantly remind people of, some things that are talked about, but not correct. Interesting. Should have primed me with that one, Bill. I yeah. Well, sometimes just catching people off the top of their head. Maybe it's the most recent one you encountered. Since I'm spending so much time working with ventilation these days, I think that probably my latest pet peeve is how people put in HRVs and ERVs and don't balance them and just sell them as a box full of parts. And that is not only a pet peeve, it's also becomes dangerous because I think a lot of people do that. Their homeowners are uncomfortable and so they shut them off. And as we talked about earlier, these tight houses, when they get so quiet inside, people hear ventilation systems cycling on and off. So people turn them off and stuff them full of socks. And that's dangerous when you have a tight house. Yeah, forget to turn them on again. Yeah. Or don't want to turn them on. Yeah. When they're needed, they're installed for a reason. What's it looking like for the rest of the year for you going into 2022? I'm working on, whew, boy. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of things. <laughs> a bunch of stuff for ICF, um, working on ground source heat pumps, working on combustion byproducts and impacts on health. So these would be trapped indoor pollutants. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to mention to you, you know, because of your diagnostic tools end of things, there is a wonderful array of murder weapons. 
<laughs> in building stuff. I don't know if you know Dr. Stephanie Taylor. Yes. She has said that if you rob a house, you'd have to do it within five minutes. Otherwise, a forensic microbiologist would be able to tell lots of things about you. Things like infrared cameras where you can see heat patterns, the dogs walking across the floor, just the tools that novelists have never had to work with before. <laughs> I actually had Stephanie on my podcast a few months ago, maybe around the turn of the year. Yeah. Yeah, earlier in the year. So we talked about humidity then. Her metagenomic tools that she talks about are pretty fascinating stuff. And then there are all the wonderful things about Chinese drywall and... Formicary corrosion. Yeah. So lots of things to work on as far as news stories, buildings collapsing. I did some research on the number of books that have been centered around homes and houses, like Wuthering Heights and other stories. That, In fact, there was one, believe it or not, called The House That Kills. And it was one of the closed rooms, mysteries, where you know all the doors and windows are closed and somebody dies inside the room and how does this happen? That was a whole genre that came along. And this House That Kills book, the guy actually, they used perfume as a tracer gas to determine where the air was flowing into the room. And that was written, I think it was 1918. It's pretty amazing stuff. So there's lots of fun things to play with, Bill. Maybe you and I can sit down sometime and you can tell me all these tools I can use in my stories. Yeah, brainstorm about this stuff. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Does Amityville Horror count as a house that kills? The interesting thing is usually not the house. It's usually the occupants. There's this incredible book called 17 Church Row, which the house is designed it's a scary as hell book. It's designed to be a smart house, as you mentioned earlier. And the house ends up locking all the doors and itself. And that's in the memory because the creator of the chip tried to destroy the memory on the chip. And it's spread itself out all over the world and then reassembled in this house. And Hell, open the pod bay doors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Well, on that note, we will close the, <laughs> the podcast bay doors. There you go. And wrap up with you this morning, Paul. It was wonderful. Any closing thoughts? I had a thing I wrote down here that said, the trick is understanding building science and then manipulating it to kill. Understanding your weapon. It should not be a stupid accident due to carelessness. Very good. Ramifications. So it's fun. Thank you so much, Bill. Yeah, thank you. We'll get this out there, uh, get some links in the show notes, give people an overview, and, and get them to think differently about the weapons they carry and <laughs> wield on a daily basis. There you go. Take care. Thank you, Paul. Take care, Bill. Thanks. Thanks for listening into this episode of the Building HVAC Science Podcast. If you want to keep up with things that we find interesting, type Building HVAC Science into the Facebook search bar. You'll find our Facebook page. Hope you enjoyed this interview with Paul. We talked about all his different ideas, being a scientist, author, inventor, business owner. The Building HVC Science Podcast is a production of True Tech Tools Limited, and we hope to have you back again next time, filling your mind with some different thoughts about building HVC science. Take care, everyone.